Travis, pumped to be here. First of all, I, I want to bring you some publicity, but not too much because um, I don't want to lose my spot at the bar and for dinner. But I wanted to come in here and talk about the secrets to winning for you for a couple points. One is you have a restaurant, you've been, you're an industry veteran, but it takes a lot of guts to do what you've done, particularly in the market and the con community that we're in. Second, you're a competitive racer, been a racer your entire life. So we're going to talk about a variety of different topics today. Talk to, tell me first and foremost of what led you to wanting to start your own community-based restaurant? Because I bet you had more naysayers than you had supporters. 100%. I moved to Birmingham to this Dunamit Valley area in 2007. I uh, worked for uh, a local corporation. Um, love this community. Uh, it's raised our daughter here. I've uh, met some of our closest friends are, are all here. Um, I uh, ventured out into multi-unit with a couple different companies over the last 15 years, which led me to a lot of travel, opening a lot of restaurants, uh, living in hotel rooms and on airplanes, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you're used to. Yep. And uh, uh, the pandemic uh, really hurt our industry. I mean, it decimated our industry. So I was left without a job and trying to figure out what I was going to do next at, at 50 years old. And um, so, the, I, so the obvious answer is go open a restaurant. Well, not initially. So <laughs> because it's, it is, it's scary. I mean, you think about oh, how, yeah, many, how, how many restaurants fail. It's, Dude, it's unbelievable. Yeah. And, and I've worked for corporations that are worth hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars that some of the restaurants close down. So you think about the infrastructure of a large corporation from marketing to R&D to, to real estate directors to everything. And then think about a mom and pop. So if those restaurants can fail, how the hell is a mom and pop going to make it with, without all that, that foundation below them? Yeah. So for me, it was, uh, it, it was, it was tough. Uh, somebody asked me when I first started, they said, you know, how are you feeling right now? Give me three <laughs> words when I started to go down this road. And it was, uh, uh, it was grateful that I'm healthy enough and I had the opportunity and I found a space. Um, uh, and then I said, I think the next one was fearful and, um, uh, so I was fearful and I was grateful and I was it, it very, I was very hesitant. I was very, it was, it was scary, but yeah. I, I never, I never, ever, ever had a plan B. I just didn't. And that sounds very no, frivolous. But no, I no, was, no. When I started the mind side 12 years ago, I had no plan B. Mm -hmm. uh, my oldest 25 now, sh she was starting freshman year in high school. We had no college plan. I mean, we had made smart business decisions, but it wasn't like I sat there with this you know, 527 sitting there with a bunch of cash, right. my IRA, I couldn't touch. So, I mean, it was, I, I know exactly, mm -hmm. but it's critical for people because a lot of people in the industries will tell you as you're starting, whether you want to play professional ball, college ball, you want to start your business, you want to go all in. It's like, we'll have some options available. You had no options. If knock on wood, had this failed, what would you have done? I'd probably be back working for some corporation, making a lot of people, a lot of money. Okay. I mean, that's, that, that's the truth because yeah. the, the big boys, the big boys out there, the, the big brands that So you're talking know. the big brands like the, like who owns, like, well, the Outback group. Bloomin' Brands, right. Bloomin' Brands, right. who's got who, what? They've, they've Fleming's, got Outback, Outback Carabas, Carabas, Bonefish. Bonefish. Yep. And then yep. you've got, who's the ones that own, um, who is it, the Olive Gardens, the season 52? Darden out of Darden. Orlando, Florida. Yep. Yeah. And it would it would have meant having to move again. And I have a young family. Um, I've taken my wife all over. I mean, she, we met in Oregon when I, in the restaurant business. She wasn't. I was. Yeah. And um, I've taken her away from her family in Oregon, where they all live, to Florida, Florida to Birmingham, Birmingham back to Florida until the pandemic, and now I'm back to Birmingham again. I'm done. I mean, it was, it was you know, so for me to have a position at my level with my bandwidth and my experience – in Birmingham, Birmingham has amazing restaurants, but think about it. We have a lot of independent restaurants mm. in, in Birmingham that are amazing. Um, but for me to be able to have the job that I want to be able to support my family that I really love, we probably have to move again. And I, I literally couldn't do that again. We, and, lo and, we love And it just so for our listeners can understand as we're listening to this, you were here in Birmingham when Fleming's was good. Right, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but you and Oliver, yeah, we, your chef uh, partner. We were, we were partners uh, there. I was there for six years. Um, Oliver was there a total of 15, Okay, um, which 
It's not the same. Yeah, well, I, I'm not. I'm not knocking the people that are there. But well, no, it's 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 all it's all leadership. And you know, back in the day, we had. It was the place he, to eat in Birmingham besides yeah, Highlands. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hot, I mean, it was yeah. for a chain. That's saying something. One hundred percent. Yeah, we had. I mean, I, I, I don't think units. people could understand. I mean, it was, it was the place that you went for great food, and it was a chain. Yeah. I mean, that's that says something about execution. Huge, huge. Yes. And we tried to. We, our culture at Fleming's was, and Outback did this back in the day, because I worked at the original in Tampa, Florida in college. Mm -hmm. Um, Our deal was we are not, we're not a restaurant chain. We're a chain of individually owned restaurants. So I was the operating partner. Oliver was a chef partner. So we had Mm -hmm. skin in the game at that restaurant. We were we were part owners in that. So that's how it works. You have to have ownership buy-in to work. Correct. Correct. Um, So that was, uh, that. that's what. I think really moved Fleming's along. And at the time we had 65 in the United States and we, the last year I was there, we were ranked fifth in the country in revenue. And that's, that's higher revenue than Chicago, Boston, Houston, Atlanta, little wow. old Birmingham, Alabama. Yeah. And uh, I probably would still be there, but I. Did I they went, keep you in for a period of time and then they kick you out? They, well, you, you, you have a five-year contract, okay. which is great. Because yeah. most restaurants, you really kind of get into your stride after year two and three. So after five years, they give you, they do what's called a buyout or an event, if you will. And you can either re-sign a contract for another five years because you, you have to establish continuity. That's the problem. I want to come back to that as leadership. Yeah. Okay. Because that's, that's something I think is critical is about what it takes to build culture. Because, you know, people are like, how do I, get, how do I connect with today's generation? Mm-hmm. You're doing it in a restaurant. Right. I mean, and so I want to come back to that. So, okay. so you, you get to the event and you do the buyout. Correct. So they have a formula, a multiple, if you will, where after five years, you put your head down, you do a great job. And if you do a great job, then there's a nice little check change there at the end. And you're six, seven nights a week. Yeah, initially, yes. Yeah. But once you get up and going, like anything else, you, you find your stride and you, you, know, you can get your two days off a week and your yeah. two, three vacations a year. Uh, the best part about that company was that after a five-year contract, they would pay you for a one-month sabbatical. Oh, wow. If you were to re-sign and come back for yeah. another five years. That is if they wanted you. If they wanted right, you. Right. Yeah, and you were performing. Correct. So it was great. And the only reason I left that job is because I, I'm a, a ladder climber. I, I always want to get to the next level. It's, I, I wanted to go to multi-unit. I was great at running. What, is, what does that mean? You want to go to multiple shops? I, I want to oversee guys like me in that position, okay. which I did. So, you know, most recently with my former company, Metro Diner, 70 restaurants, had 13 regional managers, joint venture partners that were, that, that I was overseeing and um, coaching and teaching. And a lot of them were, had just as much experience as I did. So I learned from them as well. But we had a great culture, great family, but I really enjoyed that kind of learning new things. Yeah. Um, this to me, as you can see, you've, you've been in here a lot. You, a lot. You see that. Yeah, we're, and, we're here and, a lot. And, <laughs> and I appreciate <laughs> are that. Are we on the list? <laughs> are we on the top? Are we, in the, are we on the first you, page? You 100% are. Now, let me, for our listeners, I'm going to explain why. Um, there's a reason that Drew is here. Being from Louisiana, you have local restaurants. You support the local person. So that, that was always big for us. Living out in the burbs of Birmingham, you have a couple small restaurants. You have a lot of chains. There's not a lot down here. So when we knew a local restaurant was coming and then we knew the local restaurant was good, okay? Good first. I was like, good, we can support it. Didn't realize it was freaking exceptional. And I don't mean to try to get a free drink out of you. Your restaurant's fucking great. Thank and, you. And it's great because the people are great, the food quality is great and everything. And so what happens is my wife and I work out of the house, run the business, we get done with the day, and it's like, what do you, what do you want to do? Like, well, let's just run up to Oak House. One is because now we've got the community of people up here. We see you guys. But the food delivers, and it's something different all the time. But the quality is so good. I can't repeat that at home. And so working the way that we work and working, you know, like you 100-hour weeks, the last thing I'm going to do is turn at 7 o'clock at night and start cooking. Right. And, you know, I can eat a turkey sandwich, but it's like I want to go and decompress. So I come up here, and the food is so good that that's the consistency. And that's why I wanted to talk to you on the podcast is what does it take? Because what hit me on the podcast was – it was about eight weeks ago. You guys were sitting here, and you had gotten some wine from Italy. And Oliver, your chef, was like, let me try to come up with 
I don't want to say Marsala. It was. It was it was a dry Marsala imported from um, from Sicily. Okay. And it is what Johnny Caraba, the only thing he'll use. I don't know if they still use it or not at Carabas, but if you read Johnny Caraba's his uh, his cookbook, if you will, yeah. he's amazing. I mean, his 95-year-old mother still works at the original in Houston, Texas. Really? And I was actually talking with Chris Sullivan today yeah. about Johnny Caraba because he's still doing some other stuff. But that's the best story ever. I mean, was, here's a small Italian family who opens up a restaurant in Texas, opens up another one, and it gets acquired by OSI at the time, which was Bloom and Brands yeah, now. Two, but two restaurants got acquired. Two of them. And, and now there's, what, over you know, a couple hundred in the United States, probably yeah. more, I'm not sure. But... Anyway, I love chicken marsala. Make it home all the time. But one day, I was reading his cookbook, and I saw that they, if you go to the town in Sicily and tell them that you know Carabas, at one point, they were the number one importer in the United States of their marsala wine. No kidding. So I bought a case of it, brought it into Oliver, and next thing you know, we're finishing up the shift, and he comes out a couple of <laughs> couple yeah. bowls of chicken marsala. He's like, what do you think? Right. You know, but, what I loved so about, but what I loved about that is he brings it out, and you go, first thing you do is you go, yeah, not there yet. There was no hurt feelings. There was no frustrations. There was no, like, I've, I've given everything I've had. And instead, it was like, you're right. I need to do this better. <clears throat> and I know so many leaders want to be able to say that, but they're so afraid to upset people. Well, I'll tell you this. <clears throat> and we spoke about some popular chefs earlier yeah. before you got, when you got here. One thing I can say about operators like myself, I'll call them front of house people. Mm -hmm. The guys that, that, you know, shake hands and kiss babies and, and, and do the numbers and, and everything else. There are very few that are cohesive with their chefs. They're just not the same. They think differently. You see the shows. You see the chef shows and how they are. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine me with uh, – What's his Gordon name? Gordon Ramsay. Yeah, Gordon Ramsay. I mean, we want to kill somebody. Right. I mean, my very best friend who lives in Vegas worked for uh, uh, a company called um, RH Seafood, RM Seafood, Rick Moonen, a, a great chef. But I remember having conversations with Noel and trying to talk him off a cliff because it, it's just so difficult when you have somebody that is so enamored with their food. They think that nothing, like everything's perfect. I can tell you right now, he and I, we're, we're – we're right as rain. We we get along. We have no. There's no thin skin. We're we're brothers, and I think that's. But where does that trust come from? Because that's what people want. Like, I believe that trust is the currency of leadership. Okay. Well, it's funny you said that. That's one of my three. My top three are uh, 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 you know principles, if you will, are trust, fun, and courage. And okay. trust is always first, yeah. right? You you got to trust. You trust is so important. I'm glad you said that. Um, I, you know, Oliver already being at Fleming's for close to five years before I took over, and I come in, ball of fire, Italian guy, you know, started at the original Outback, knows so many people in the organization, here I come, and I was a lot different in 2007. I mean, we're just 15 years ago, mm -hmm. and I think you still can see I'm a <laughs> pretty, pretty type A, yeah, passionate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I can tell you that he was very patient with me when I came in because I was a ball of fire, and he really he, – he, he talked me off the ledge a few times mm. and still does. And, and I do the same with him. It's so funny because the things I'll get excited about, he looks at me, he's like, relax. Mm. And the things that he gets fired about, mm. then all of a sudden I'm relaxed. It just works. I can't, I can't explain it. Right. Uh, it just but there's, there's a sense of the trust allows honesty. Mm-hmm. Like, you're not in here. you got a lot of repeat customers. 100%. What are you in about? What, what do you think your ratio is, new to repeat? And I'm not talking about your top 10 percenters that I know that are in here all the time. But the people that are in a lot, like. Uh, it's got to be the 2080 rule. i got to tell you. you I, got 80% really, repeaters. I really, I really believe so, yes. Yeah, and I too. still, the best part about fine dining is that the majority of our guests or reservations other than the ones that sit at the bar, some of the walk-ins. So I get to see how many times they've eaten here. And I can tell you, even this evening, we're, f we're fully booked this evening and literally over 20% first time they've been here, which is remarkable that we're coming up on a year in this little community out here, and I'm still getting first-timers after a year. That's, that says something. So are you more jazzed by the first-timers or the repeaters? Oh, both. Well, I'll tell you this. One thing that I 
don't want to do, which I, I've seen in, a, in a diff, a, another life in the restaurant industry, mm -hmm. you cannot take your regulars for granted. Because I'm telling you, they'll feel it, and they'll stop coming. And I'll never let that happen. I, mean, I, I treat everybody the same as I'd want to be treated, but you can't get – if you get too comfortable with your guest – and I've had to coach a couple people here. I have some, some young mm -hmm. servers that will come up to a, uh, a regular guest, like, be, like you, mm -hmm. and you're, you're very open and you're approachable. Mm -hmm. But you're here spending your hard-earned money and wanting to have a good meal. I, the last thing you want is somebody being, coming up and being too comfortable with you when they're here to serve you and take care of you and show hospitality. So I always try to preach and coach and teach professionalism all the time. That doesn't mean that I don't cut up with my guests. Yeah. Or I, I, want, I want my team to build relationships, but there is a line, right? Yeah. You have to be, you cannot, you cannot cross that line. So I would treat a first time guest just like my, my regulars. You know, I, I, really, I really believe it's important. So <clears throat> from a professionalism, so a standard and a vision, okay? You've got a standard of what it takes to be here, but your, your crew, your team here doesn't turn over very much. I have literally nearly 0% turnover. Now, mind you, that's I created a nice model here where we're only open five days a week, dinner only. That's very attractive in this day and age to people. Yeah. Um, and not finance. So people, because it was a little question I had is like lunch. Lunch is a no-go. Like you have to double what you're doing. C correct. And look, never say never. Yeah. Oliver and I are going to sit down after we get through our first year, which is coming up very soon. We're going to sit down. We're going to, we're going to go through the menu. We're going to talk about, you know, where do we go from here? Do we, do we allow takeout? Yeah, because as a competitor, you can't sit here and think this is it. No, no, no. We have a lot more runway, 100% more mm -hmm. runway. But my goal was to get through the, this first year with high standard quality of food and service, execute like a son of a gun, mm -hmm. be all over it execution-wise. And the third one is – making sure that I had as little turnover as possible. That will kill a business. Kill a business. It, I don't think people Front realize. of the house or back of the house, which both, is worse? Both. 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 I mean, I, I really, you think about it, we have 20 team members here, and I think this year maybe, maybe I've lost five, but of the five, a couple have come back because they're kids that go to school or had yeah. sports or what have you. Um, but that continuity of having – you know, that, that tenure in your establishment is huge. It's huge. So when people look at a restaurant like this and they see vision and they see you working, I mean, the failure rate of business of restaurants is astronomical. Huge. Okay. Yeah. I mean, how do you even get funding for that now? Or is it private funded? So, no, I mean, we, we obviously got a, a loan from the bank, but okay. it wasn't enormous. But it, has, know, to lot, on, lot it has to come on your back correct, of your yeah. history. But, but it can't be like me going into the bank saying, I want to start a chicken finger restaurant. Well, you need to make sure you have a good business plan. You need to make sure you have money to you know, okay. put down. So, yeah. no, I'm, I partners and myself, we put in a substantial chunk of change okay. that if we failed, it'd be ugly. Yeah. I'd be living at your house. Yeah, and you're welcome to as long as you don't <laughs> cook. No, I, you're not going to fail. But I think, I think people have to understand when you see restaurants start up, I mean, how, how do you scale profit? Because there's, it's only you guys here. Right. And you've got catering, you've got – but then all of a sudden it changes the model. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, sales cure all. And okay. anybody listening to this podcast is going to – you know, that, that's a standardized verbiage for a restaurant tour. Sales cure all, so, period. So for us, it was about making sure we could – increase our revenue and, and scale our revenue up, which means maybe a, an extra turn or half a turn of tables per evening. So that's, that's the statistics you like. I want to ask you, like, what are the statistical variables that you look at? Turns, how many people can you get through a, a, to sit in a booth in one night? Correct. I mean, really, if you are, and remember, I, I didn't really advertise initially and no. I really still haven't. No, you don't really advertise. Well, and the reason I didn't is because I've been part of companies that hype up their new opening big time spend so many so much money on advertising they get a line out the door and they lay an egg because mm. they can't execute it's, it's they're, overwhelming. They're, they're not seasoned my team now is seasoned we could we could run this restaurant 24 hours right we could open up right now and stay open for 24 hours straight and i guarantee you it'd be go go like they all if you can't get any busier 
Yeah. It's very at that point it's all very formulaic, right? You're just you're just going. It's just a longer longer time limit. Um but we couldn't have done that in the first month or two. It's taken time. Now, I mean, we're pretty much a well oiled machine. Yeah. So Anyway, that's so that's so the profit. I mean, obviously, people the the layperson thinks, okay, you make your money on the bar drinks. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I, mean, I don't want the secrets. I mean, I'm not saying this in a bad way. Like, you want people to come in, but you want turn, you want volume, you want Correct. margins, you want stuff yeah. like that. So, from a leader, you're having to coach to those levels, right? 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 I mean, it's no different than a basketball coach looking at where a defense is weak and trying to mm-hmm. develop a game plan to execute that strategy. Mm-hmm. For you, when you see things and you're looking at like, okay, we're going into the holiday season. We're filming this right before Christmas. This is a busy time, but your Christmas is on a Sunday. Are you guys closed Christmas Eve? We are open Christmas Eve. We're doing prefix. Okay. We're doing two seatings, and we're already we're already yeah, full, fully booked. booked. But, yeah, yeah. but but back to your kind of measurements, if you will. The goal is obviously to be busy, get sales. Yeah. The biggest hurdle any restaurateur has been dealing with is cost of goods. Yeah, that's right? kind of where I'm going with this. Which has been, I can tell you right now, and I know this, and you can, you can Google it. You can get on the phone and call some VPs of other companies. Our, our segment of fine dining, I, I would tell you that the big boys out there are probably running 26 to 28% food cost. I can tell you right now, I'm way higher than that for two reasons. A, because I don't have the purchasing power they do. Yeah, you can't. You're not purchasing fifty or hundred. Yeah, I, I'm get, I get killed on that. Yeah. So when when you look at our prices in our menu, and anybody who looks at our prices and says, "Wow, they're overpriced," you ha- it, we're not even close. Never once has entered my mind. Okay. Well, I appreciate that, but uh, uh, but it's, it's, it is expensive so though. But well, it is expensive, and the quality is great. But I will tell you that. Food cost You're going to get a W-9 from us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we come up here so it. much. Oh, I'll take it. 10.99 or I whatever will it's take called. 10.99. Yeah, 10.99, yeah. W-9, but, W-2, you know, you 10.99. Look at, you, look at some, you look at food cost, and I tell you, we are so, so high. And we're working on it. It's only been a year. But I can tell you right now that that's where mom and pops get hurt. But you won't hurt. sacrifice on the quality. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. I'm not going to do it. Because it will eventually get you. It will. Like I, I, the number of times people, to your point, they open strong, they have all the superstars come in, they fade away, and then you just start watching the quality slowly you would start know, reducing. You would know after one bite if I started bringing in steaks out of, uh, already cryovacked or, or, or vacuum sealed. Okay. We hand cut all our steaks here. So yeah. Oliver's back there like a – like a Ginsu, sh- I mean, he is like unbelievable with a knife and, and, and cutting meat. Yeah. If I were to take a cryovac steak, that can seal. Water. I, if I did put that on the grill and a hand cut steak on the grill, <clears throat> I know you, you know food, yeah. you, you'd know in one bite. If we brought in our chicken piccata sauce in a bag and put it in a pot of boiling water, which we could easily do, versus the one we make fresh every single day, you would know in two seconds. So if you go the Cisco route versus I, I'm not knocking, but I mean no, that, no. Yeah. If you, uh, but a lot of, and don't get me wrong, so, some of that they call it chef driven. Some of these like uh, chef made uh, 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 products, they're great. Yeah. But there's a definitive difference if you have a good palate and you are used to this type of food. And our customer, our guest that comes into this restaurant, they're well traveled. They've been to big restaurants. They get it. Mm-hmm. And they would know in two seconds. And I, and, and I would never be able to go to a table. But you told me something I thought was interesting. You were like, he makes the bread pudding every day. Yeah. Yeah. And, he, and a couple of nights we've had to throw it away, and I've had to go to tables with my tail between my legs and tell them that we're out of bread pudding. And they're kind of looking at me like I have three heads. Because go, you ran out or because no, it was because bad? No, he, he because he, he, he made it improper. He didn't make it right. Or it didn't set properly. Yeah. Like the custard wasn't throughout. It fell to the bottom. And Oliver, he's, he's too proud. He won't do it. Yeah. He'd rather – Go to the table, and, and I should have made him do it. <laughs> <So> <laughs> you know, I, but, but but a local restaurant, uh, like a restaurant like this, you can get away with that. You, you can. A little bit better. Yeah. Because one is, well, if you've got 80% returns, but you got yeah. people who are believing in what you're doing, mm-hmm. and there's a standard, and you're like, I just failed to live up. True. We just failed to deliver on that standard yeah. today. Yeah. I'm just not a very good liar. So when I go to a table, I want to feel so extremely confident that – in my product, our product, that you can't you can't pull me off my game. And if it's not right, I'm gonna fix it. And our food, as you know, I I, I put it up against anybody's. It's that good. 
We don't cut any corners. No. Now, it might hurt me in the pocketbook a little bit, but I'll figure it out, and hopefully commodities will come down a little bit next year. But right well, now, where, they're high. Where is the restaurant industry going? Because, do you know, COVID, you couldn't sit in restaurants. You couldn't – I mean, I know people are like, oh, I'm so sick and tired about talking about restaurants or um, pandemic, but it was the greatest wrinkle we've ever had. Yeah, we, got, we got killed. And, and not only did the restaurant industry get killed in COVID, people don't realize that per employee in the restaurant industry – we have the least amount of profit per employee than any other industry. Oh. Now, you may say, well, it's because you have, you know, you got a, a chain restaurant has 100 employees. That's why. But no, seriously, you do the research on it. The profitability in the restaurant industry is if you're at 10%, you're knocking it out of the park, which is scary. That's terrifying. That's horrible. I mean, I have friends that own their own businesses, and they're like, ugh, I wouldn't do that. Yeah. I mean, I have a buddy the other day sent me a P&L for his business, and it was 40% cash flow. <laughs> and I go, geez, what? Where did I go wrong? Right. <laughs> so, you know, it's uh, it's it's tough, but you have to have you have to have long arms, and you have to you have to you have to look long term. If you look long term, like I'm going to do here, and make sure we keep doing everything right, you and I'll sit down five five years from today, and you go, how are things going? And and I should look like I'm a little bit taller, mm. you know. And how many how many how many branches will this have? You're talking about scaling yeah. the, the concept. I, I told myself that I wouldn't even consider it until after I got through the first year so I could sit down with a clear head and kind of look at the numbers and then talk is that to the, some Is guests. the first year the first landmark? I got to imagine three months is probably the first landmark, six months. It, it, yeah. I mean, you obviously look, yeah. at, I mean, you look at your first quarter and kind of go, okay, where are we, what do we need to do here? Um, you know, this year, prices start going through the roof. Yeah. When I opened in January, by March – I mean, I had some of my prices were 10 to 15 percent higher, and not just food. We're talking alcohol as well. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. Which like, really? anything they could go up on, they went up on. I know exactly. I mean, yeah. Um, so you know, really, you know, do I want to scale it? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd like to. I've done it. I've opened up a lot of restaurants. I mean, with Metro Diner, we went from 26 to nearly 70 in a matter of you know a couple of years, and and I'd like to think I was a you know a big help in that. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I had a huge team behind me. To think about Oak House being a national brand, that doesn't cross my mind right now. I just think that Birmingham may be big enough for another one. Mm. And then you, you, you cross that bridge when you get to it, I suppose. Where do you, if, you, if you could pick your restaurant to go eat at, not your own, where would you go? It's a loaded question. I know. What, in Birmingham? No. You in Vegas? You in Tampa? You in Miami? Where are you at? You know, I really yeah, – my, my The fact is, that you haven't been to New Orleans, I'm taking you there. No, I've been, but, to, I've been to Dickie Brennan's. Okay. That's the only place I've been really there and a bunch of other places. But I was always a young I mean, Dickie kid, Brennan's so I, good, I couldn't but afford I mean, it. I was, yeah, every I time I'm, I went there – I'm going to take you to some places that okay. yeah, make your I, hair I'm grow. ready to go. Um, I, I think that a restaurant that I really love that was a lot of inspiration for Oak House was a restaurant in Tampa, uh, my hometown, that – we went to a lot when we were there for three years, and I was running Metro mm-hmm. Diners, director of ops. Uh, it's called On Swan. On Swan is Swan is the road. Mm-hmm. Very just a great name, right? Yeah. On Swan. Uh, the gentleman who owns that I've known since I was about eight years old. He was my father's. My father and he were were uh, partners in the restaurant industry back in the the 80s with Outback Steakhouse. They were the first joint venture partners ever with Outback. Wow. So they were in Central Florida. Um, this gentleman went on to uh, be president at Bonefish Grill and then ended up doing his own restaurant with some partners called On Swan. And he and his wife are the best ever, and I, I love their restaurant. I love their model. And I got to tell you, I, it, you know, imitation's flattery. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say we're the same as them. I don't think we have the same food. But just the, the feel the upscale casual, if you will, I told myself I'd never have wear a suit and tie to work ever again. Mm-hmm. But where we are out here, we have, you know, we are in the suburbs. I wanted that upscale food, like I told you earlier, quality yeah. of service. But I didn't want people to have to spend two hours getting ready to come to my restaurant. Yeah. You know. Like, like the downtown Birmingham market is, I mean, obviously it's a culinary market. Love it. Great. People locally. Yep. People to know, I mean, Highlands Bar and Grill, James Beard Award winner. 
I think they won the restaurant and, call, and pastry in the same year. Yep. That's pretty damn yeah. good. Frank Stitz and his wife, they're, they're f- remarkable. They're amazing. Yeah, and I think people forget, don't understand. Uh, we're not Atlanta. We're not Nashville. We're not that. But Birmingham has a culinary market. But it's mostly hidden Mountain Brook, Homewood. Correct. Downtown. Out here, there's not, there's not things. No. It takes vision. Yep. Now, what's going to happen is you're going to bring more out here, right? It has to. People see a success of something. They're not going to come in the same parking lot, but they're going to, mm-hmm. it's going to inspire somebody else to do something else. Right. Are you prepared to deal with your competition? Absolutely. I think, I think competition is a good thing. You, know, you think about uh, – I remember when I was young in my career with Outback and I was in Oregon, and I'll never forget – we were in a, a very large area, kind of like the summit, a, a little bit smaller. Mm-hmm. But I remember a couple of chain restaurants popping up on either side of me. And I remember that the first month or so, we had a little small decline in sales. But then after that, we went through the roof. And it was a lot of that because we, we executed really well and had good food, but it brought more people to the area. So if I was on an hour wait, at Outback, somebody might go, they might be on a time crunch going to a concert or going somewhere, so they go next door to the other place, and then vice versa. So we all kind of supported one another. Hmm. Uh, you, think about, you think about the summit, how much competition is up there. Yeah. I mean, we, we have some great restaurants up there, and they all do well. Hmm. I mean, so, I, you know, if somebody were to come out here, it, it's great. I mean, it gives me, it gives me a place to go. Oh, I don't want more people to, to come out here. <laughs> I mean, that's my own, you know, I drive up, I'm like, what's it look like? But because, uh, you know, it's, it's just so easy. Okay, so you're a competitor, but it's not like you're a restaurant. I mean, you're an Olympian runner. Well. Olympic trial, Olympic hopeful at the time, right? You were in the hunt. You were going for it. I was going for it, yeah. yeah. I, I wasn't, the, I wasn't the, the one percenter, but uh, the year that I did make the time standard and qualify for the Olympic trials marathon, the only 135 men – that year qualified to try to qualify for the Atlanta Olympics. So you think about that. All the distance runners in the United States, only 135 men. I don't know how many women qualified that year, but 135 men. I remember because I was ranked like 131st going into the race. Mm -hmm. And I placed 60th. So 60th is a long cry from top three that made the Olympic team. But I was proud of that. Hell yeah! And, and you know, had first I, of all, you finished it. I mean, yeah. I, that would be that would be my <laughs> goal. I mean, yeah. um, but what does that take? I mean, I, I know you still competitively run, and and you do that. I mean, what are the parallels there with running? I mean, because you must be a you must enjoy torture. I, I like pushing myself and reaching new limits and and seeing where that next limit is. I. I just, I don't, I love it. I just love challenging myself. I can't, I, I'm very uncomfortable sometimes being content and I just, there's nothing wrong with being content. I want to be content, but I feel that to get to the next level, sometimes you have to have the eye of the tiger. You, mm. you have to move forward. And I am, am just as crazy and passionate about my business as I am my athletics. And in terms of my athletics, I love running just as much as I did when I was 14 years old or in college as I do now. I just wish I was, <laughs> wish I still had the 14 year old legs. <laughs> what is it about enjoying running though? Because like what's enjoyable? It's uh, it, for me, it's a competition. It's so put, it's, when you're hurting, you're pushing harder. Well, or I, you're going into that darkness. Well, you want to look. It, it, most, most runners, if you were to look at them from the waist up, they're, if they're running a four-minute mile or running an eight-minute mile, they should look relatively the same, like just the fluidity and rhythm of running. Mm-hmm. But for me, it's about knowing that I have a race coming up in June and knowing that there's a guy right now living in Boulder, Colorado, who's training for that same race, and I want to kick his ass. Okay, so that goes back to the issue about restaurants. Okay. From a leadership standpoint, do you think the same? Because I am. I, that's what I do. Right. There's somebody out there. Somebody puts out an Instagram video. I'm like, God, I love that. Not, I mean, I'm like, that's great. I respect that. Mm-hmm. How do I get better? Like, there is a self-comparison that goes to right. it. Right. And, and, and can be eaten up from that. 
in this place, do you do that? I mean, like every single day is a competition in here. It, it, it is, and I challenge myself to do 100% table visits. I do not like, do not like when people go home and do an online review, and if they do a bad one, it's usually because Travis didn't stop by and say hello. Because I feel that if I can hit every table tonight, and we're busy tonight, and my, and I'm, my goal, like last night, I, we got caught with our pants down, we were extremely busy, and I know in my soul that I did not get an A-plus last night. I, I, I couldn't hit every table. But tonight, my goal is hit every single table so that everybody leaves here going, wow, you know, the owner came by and talked to us, and if their steak was wrong, I'm going to fix it. i got to be all over that. It's go time. Like, i got to do that. So, uh, you know, in terms of moving beyond and, and, and opening up more restaurants, that's another goal. That's another challenge. That's like going to the Olympics, yeah. right? So, what, what do you, where do you go for inspiration? Where do you, what do you read? What, do you, what fills your heart? Like, so give our listeners, I mean, coaches, teachers, people like that are listening to this. The reason I wanted somebody in this, mm-hmm. you are, you know, you are on the edge. Not just, I mean, you, you got a 10% margin there. Right. Okay. You're not on a five-year contract here. You're not, you know, having a bad year. Bad year could put you out of business. Right. Okay. Don't see it happening. You got systems in place here, so I'm not trying to say that in a bad way. But you get my point. You're on the right. edge. So where do you go to sharpen your saw like that? Besides running, I mean, but like, where do you go for a learning standpoint? I, I'm not a voracious reader. I, I you don't have time. I watch. I, I don't have the time, but yeah. I, I'm very much. Uh, uh, I have so many friends in this industry that I communicate with constantly. So you have mentors. I've, yes, that that I speak with a lot. That I bounce. We bounce ideas and share ideas with one another. But I can tell you, I'm I'm more passionate about competition and life and uh, peace of mind than I am about, I mean, look, we all love food, mm-hmm. right? If you would ask me, is this what you wanted to, is this where you saw yourself at 51 years old? No, I wanted to, I wanted to be an athlete my whole life or work for Nike or coach running or track or coach a, I think, co- co- coach I think a, me, Bash and Cedric all understand that. I mean, that's, yeah. 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 But, but what I am good at, I, I love people. I love building relationships. I love building teams. But a lot of my inspiration is probably other athletes or the races that I have. Like, my wife does not understand why I go south. I go dark when I, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not signed up for anything. Mm. She's, why can't you just keep, keep training? I go, because it's boring to me. Like, she'll, she, doesn't, she won't sign up for an event until she's trained and ready to go. I sign up for an event when I'm fat and lazy. You're, you're the, I'm going to run into the fire and figure it out. She's the, I'm going to prep it. Correct. That's the yin and the yang. That's my yeah. wife and I. Yeah. Um, I'm the dumb guy that runs to the wall. I'm like, figure it out. Mm-hmm. And she wants to make sure that everything's set up. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think it's important. So, you know, lo- looking forward, you know, here we are. We got through the first year, and now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus and I'm gonna set, my, I'm gonna set my, my, my goals for next year, and that will keep me motivated through the whole year. Well, it's killing me sitting here because I know what y'all are about to prepare, and I'm getting hungry, and <laughs> I'm sure we'll be back at some point later tonight. Yeah. But I want to thank you for doing this. I, I, congratulations on the first year. I know you're thank not you. complacent. I know what other thing I love is this is a family business. Yeah. We are a family business. And to see your wife, your daughter working up here, I get it. My kids are part of our business every day. And I understand it. It's a passion for you, but it's the culture you've created of what mm-hmm. you're trying to do. So, um People, if you're in the Birmingham area, hit Oak House. I'm telling you, it's phenomenal. Just don't come the night we're here. So there's maybe one or two nights a week. But you got to check it out. It's it's brilliantly good. And I know the standards will continue to rise. and Or not rise. The standards are already exceptional. What I mean is the demand will continue to rise and the standards will continue to, yeah. to deliver. I just don't want you to take away my opportunity to come in here. You're all good. It's so freaking good. It's <laughs> unbelievable. And you can see by the B-roll that we've got on here is that things are legit. And so... Congrats on a year. Unbelievable leadership. I knew, like I told you, I knew when you were at Fleming's because I used to watch and I'd go there because I had to for business. But I knew what you were doing then. And then I knew when you were opening this, I was like, it's going to be really freaking good. And it has been. Thank you. And it's continuing to be great. And everyone I always talk to, I'm like, hey, you gone to Oka's? Oh, man, I love that place. Awesome. So keep it up. Appreciate you. Thank you. Got you, it, brother. Thank you.